Hello everyone, my name is Marcus. Thank you very much uh, for having me. It's a pleasure to talk to you about brand strategy, positioning and how differentiation is absolute key in today's world, especially when you think digital. But well, let's get to it. We're going to um, uh, take a little bit of time to get familiar with the concepts of branding as such with positioning as such, and then deep dive into the great worlds and worlds and the intersection of where digital and brand strategy actually meet. All right, so first things first, my name is Marcus. Um, I spend my world in the, in the space of brand strategy, marketing, helping brands and businesses grow their propositions. Uh, we lead an agency amongst um, other things. I also teach at the CAS Business School and I've been independent for about seven years now. I think this is my eighth year. And before that, I worked client side, mainly on powerful brands and big brands around the globe. Harley Davidson is one of them. They're now a client, which is a, it's a pleasure. And Aston Martin is another great brand that I had the opportunity to, um, to, to run marketing for them globally. I also have a book, if anyone's interested, let me know, The Guiding Purpose Strategy, a Navigational Code for Brand and for Brand Growth. And I'm also the co-author of the Responsible Investment Brand Index. But enough about me, you're not here for me, but for what I have to share today. We're going to look at the brand strategy meets digital or perhaps the other way, digital meets brand strategy. So brand strategy really aims at positioning in the hearts and minds of customers. It's a very, very established concept. We'll unpack it just a little bit. And then we look at the intersection where brand strategy meets digital and digital essentially, whereas there is strategies and strategies and tactics, of course, as well, it really is about the tools that get you there. So it's the how to, once you know where you want to be, why you want to be there, then it's how do I get there. And so digital plays a huge role in enabling this and generally however way we turn it it's linked to growth and a growth mindset and the two combined can actually be a very powerful catalyst to help you grow your business your brand your product we shall see perhaps a lot more so my objective in the next 40 minutes or so is to really take you on a journey I'm not uh, on this Fairline Squadron 78 unfortunately but here on the, on the screen into the world of brand, into the world of positioning, into the world of digital. And hopefully I can contribute um, to stimulate your thinking as part of the Digital Marketing uh, Europe conference. All right, how are we going to do this? We we'll look at attention, relevancy and speed as key drivers. We'll unpack a little bit why branding matters. And then we specifically look at positioning. We bridge it to digital and talk a little bit uh, about a framework that ho can hopefully help you crack it and become better at the intersection where brand strategy and digital meet. So why do I say differentiate or die? As you will see, positioning is about exclusion and really especially when you take into consideration attention, relevancy and speed, there is just no place for anyone in the middle. So you have to be really, really clear on who you are. Um, either you're at the very top or the very bottom, you generally then work on volume and scale. Uh, if you're at the very top, you generally work on exclusivity and scarcity, for instance, but there is not much room in the middle and differentiation is very much about picking your spot. And I would say, and I would claim that if you don't manage this, especially in times of acceleration, then you really don't start, stand uh, much of a chance. All right, this is our agenda for the next 40 minutes. Let's crack on and jump into it. So firstly, I've mentioned earlier on that really digital and branding is linked to growth. So just how strongly is it linked to growth? Here we have a chart that is a, based on a survey of asking marketeers generally and business leaders what in terms of digital marketing activities really contributes mostly to commercial impact. So what do I do in marketing that really drives my business forward? And it's interesting that this chart actually hasn't changed much over the last, I would say, five years. If you're interested, I do have trend studies that I can share on this as well. Whereas probably 10 years ago, it was still, and it's still true today, but a lot less so, it was all about data, it was all about marketing automation, it's all about efficiency. The understanding and recognition today is that how can we use good stories, a powerful content to drive content marketing? There's a good reason for it, as we shall see. But as you can see, number one here is 
content marketing. Of course, we've got a few other bits and pieces as well. For instance, we've got um, yeah, social media marketing here. We've got uh, SEO here. We've got all kind of stuff that, uh, you know, of course, fights for it as well. But digital is no longer just about mobile marketing or the Internet of Things growing too. There's a lot of um, sort of cross disciplines across the spectrum of digital, of course, here. But the big, big stuff is happening up here the big stuff is happening in how do I create relevancy? How do I utilize the relevancy through stories? How do I automate it? And what do I do with the data that essentially comes out of it? But if you just look for one and what really drives commercial impact across all sectors, then it's content marketing in digital. And so, of course, I mean, you guys are in digital, you probably know this as well as I do, or perhaps even better, that content marketing is impacting most of these things, but it impacts one thing in particular, and it impacts our level and our ability to actually be attentive. Because unless I, or, you know, if I don't manage to be attend or grab attention, there is no way I can either be relevant or I can target. So if we, th if we speak about um, the powerful drivers in digital marketing, branding, we come to it, then we really have to take a step back and say, well, why do we do this? It's about relevancy and it's about targeting. And if we think about relevancy and targeting, then we also have to understand that attention is one of the scarciest you know, not commodities, I wouldn't call it that anymore, but one of the scarcest resources that people have. If there's one thing in the world, despite all inequality, we all have the same amount of time. You guys have 24 hours in a day, I do, and you can break it down to hours, to minutes and to seconds, or you can scale it up to days, weeks, months, years, and so forth. But we all have the same amount of time that we can dedicate to whatever we choose in life. And it's about making these choices. And of course, Marketeers are very good, should be very good at understanding what choices people make. They need to really be in the minds of consumers so that they can crack the code to grab a little bit of attention for my product, for my service, for my brand. But see here, 13 hours media consumption is a US-based study, by the way. So I would just say, let's, you know, for the sake of it, of keeping it simple for today, we extrapolate this holds true. It's a lot of time we spend on media and unconsciously it's 5,000 plus messages you're bombarded with. Most of them you actually don't notice. Most of it just happens. Billboards, banners, wherever you click, wherever you drive, there's marketing messages all around it and it's just too much. So if you take the two together, the fight for attention and of course this incredibly powerful way of brands and companies to bombard us and I'm one of them that helps brands do this. Um, then the question is, of course, well, how do I crack through? How do I cut through the clutter and get my message heard? How do I get my product up there? How do I get audiences to see myself as relevant, hopefully engage, hopefully become aware and beyond that interested. And of course, I want to raise desirability for my product, whatever I have to offer all the way through to conversion. So that's the, that's, that's the holy grail pretty much. But attention is hard to come by, really hard to come by. So you can see that over the past 20 years, we've actually decreased significantly in our allocation of time to whatever you have to say. And it actually doesn't matter what. This is across every field, across not just advertisement. Our attention span has generally been decreasing. So the average attention span of a human now is just a second below a goldfish. Whether you believe in this um, or not, there is studies to underpin it, but the big picture here is that attention spans are decreasing and it has to do with the antidote with acceleration, with acceleration and where acceleration happens. And of course, in the worlds of comms, in the worlds of brand, in the world of digital, acceleration is happening at a rapid pace. So, for instance, here. I have a little um, exercise for you guys. You can calculate that yourself. But what you have here is speed of connectivity. It's a good way to outline and underpin how that works. So the two lines at the bottom of the screen here, here you can actually see um, internet usage in the developing world. You can see that here. 
um, and internet connectivity, so broadband co connectivity, and then you can see here in the developed world, and the developed world roughly at 80%, and of course, uh, the developing world accelerating um, very fast to catch up. And speed of connectivity is critical when we think about digital and how we connect the world and how and where we can grab attention. So here's the exercise. Just imagine every... Uh, let me just click here back. So every every second, every second on this world, a little human being is born. Okay, every second, one little baby sees the light of life. In this same second, four smartphones, not just the future phones, but smartphones go on the grid. So my question to you is, in the minute, it has taken me probably about a minute to tell you this fascinating stat. So... Every second, every second, four babies, every second, uh, 15 future phones. Sorry, I had that wrong. I need to correct that. One step back. Every second, four babies, every second, 15 future phones. See, every second, 15 uh, broadband connected um, smartphones. Right. OK, so let's do the calculation in two minutes then. Every second, four babies, every second, 15 smartphones. In these two minutes, it took me to tell you these fascinating stats. How many smartphones went on the grid? All right, ping me a note, ping me a note on Twitter, on LinkedIn, wherever you choose, and I'll tell you whether you're right or not. But what you can see here is that it's acceleration and it's huge. And where the world or life accelerates is in technology. That's not just true for tech, it's also true for businesses and how businesses scale. So for instance, here we have Fortune 500 companies and how long they typically took to reach a billion of market cap. Again, a US stat, but it applies more broadly. And this used to be about 20 years and it came down to just Oculus Rift, Snapchat. This is already a couple of years old to 14 months and we've just dropped below 12 months to reach 1 billion of market cap. So why is that important? speed and not just speed because it's not linear it's acceleration it's actually disproportionate in terms of what happens in the world and how quickly we can mostly if you look at the right hand side and how many of these are tech companies then i would argue most of them actually are and the more we scale the faster we speed the more we accelerate the more digital it becomes so let's just hold that thought speed. So if we take this idea of, well, attention is really hard to crack, it's really difficult to get, um, and of course everything goes fast, then how are we going to crack it? How are we going to get attention from our audiences? So this is where branding and positioning comes in. Why does branding matter in this equation and how does positioning help? And then we look at this uh, Fascinating question on how we could possibly crack it with the framework I have for you guys. Okay, so branding, first of all. Branding, let's take a step back. Branding comes from this. This is called a branding rod. And a branding rod would be used many, many years ago, hundreds of years ago, to brand an animal, a cow, for example, right? Because that's a way to identify a asset, so something uh, that you have, um, in this case, animals, for instance, but it can be, of course, anything, by endorsing it with a symbol, with a logo. Why is this important? I can put a mark on it to say this is mine uh, because, for instance, let's stay with the cattle here. If this is good quality stock, good quality cattle, then, of course, if I have a mark on it, I have identified that asset, that cow or that cattle. And if it's of good quality, then other people will recognize that. And if I do this, then other people will also be willing to pay me a proper price for it, for instance. Or if it gets lost, I can easily say this is mine, by the way, right? Because, look, I've put my mark on it. So branding comes from this very long tradition of identifying assets through endorsing them with a logo or a logo mark. Hold that thought. Now what has happened over the last, I would say probably 50 years is this. On the left hand side, if I play, if I play with my kids, okay, they're a little bit older, look at all my gray hair, but I used to play like this and with the youngest one, I can still do it. If you tell your kid, hey, come on, you know, let's play and jump, what will the kid do? Your child or the kid will just jump. And the reason why the kid does this is because it entirely, he or she entirely trusts you that you will catch her or you will catch him. Just imagine if you just do this and she or he falls, probably will never jump again. Now, how does this link to brand? 
it's unfortunate, I think, and it's such a key principle and such an easy principle that brands have become very bad at keeping their promises. So in other words, they've abused trust. And when you abuse trust, you no longer buy, you're no longer loyal and so forth. Why has that happened and why does it why does it keep happening? The reason why this keeps happening is that brands are very good at promising stuff, at creating dreams and aspirations, but generally not very good at delivering it. Depends a bit at what scale you look at. The reason they're not very good at delivering it is because of overpromise. And overpromise is a outgrowth of overambition, let's say. Especially if you're listed, especially if you're in a high pressure environment, especially when working with sales. Generally, the pressure is huge to deliver and it's easy to promise and then fall short of that delivery. And it results in an abuse, not an abuse is not the wrong word, but in a lack of trust from consumers into brands. And so branding and trust play a key role. Now, a short example here on uh, just to highlight uh, what branding is all about. On the left hand side, ladies and gentlemen, I would say, you know, you can do this exercise with me, even though we're remote here very briefly. We have on the left hand side and the right hand side two beautiful handbags. Let's just say these two handbags, they are about the same size. They're about the same um, you know, color and, uh, and, 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 and so forth. And that we just claim for the sake of argument for a little bit that these two handbags fulfill about the same function. They, they are here to transport things. Now, all the gentlemen who are listening today, it's your wife's birthday, your girlfriend's birthday. And I would like you to choose uh, one of these handbags. You can either say left or right. I don't have an interactive poll here, but you can just do it for yourself. Which one would you choose? Okay, gentlemen, your turn. You choose left or right. Just, uh, you know, do this exercise with me for a little bit. And in your mind, you pick one of those. Of course, there are gentlemen who will say, I'm not going to say I'm going to give any of these bags. That's also fine. But left or right. Now, ladies, it's your turn because you are the one that is going to receive a beautiful handbag. Now, ladies, which one would you like to receive, left or right? So, ladies, which one, left or right? You just pick one. It's just for the fun of the exercise. All right, everybody picked one of these beautiful handbags. Now, I can guarantee you that the majority, uh, almost the vast majority of the gentlemen will have picked the right one. Now, the ladies will have recognized what this is by the time uh, we talk about this and the vast majority of the ladies will have, puffed, will have picked the left one. So, gentlemen, note there's something going on. You've picked the right, the ladies picked the left, um, and there's no right or wrong here. But let me tell you what this is about the left uh, hand back here. So the left one, let me just make sure I talk about the same as you guys see. The left hand back here is an Hermes Birkin bag. It's named after famous actress Jane Birkin. She gave the name to the bag. It's made out of real crocodile leather. It actually has little diamond encrustings here and uh, white uh, diamonds. And it's crafted still by people, by real people in the outskirts of Paris. So by that time, I've told you this, you've recognized this must be a very expensive gift to make. It's about 100,000 euros roughly. But uh, gentlemen, don't despair because if you choose to give one of these bags, you don't worry, you won't get one. If if your if, if your wife's or loved one's birthday is within the next twelve months, the waiting list is a lot longer. Hundred thousand euros, huge waiting list. Hermes Birkin bag. Now here on the right hand side, gentlemen, more reasonable gift perhaps. That depends, but it's in a in a in a fast in a fast fashion store called H and M. You also get it in C N A in Europe, and it's twenty nine euros ninety. All right, twenty nine euros ninety. My question, of course, to you is what's happening? Why is this and how do we explain this? It's a huge differentiation in value for a functionally, relatively uh, similar, similar product. Okay, so of course, a lot of stuff plays here. Design, craftsmanship on this Hermes bag. Um, of course, the, all the beauty that goes into it, uh, all the um, uh, elements that make it an Hermes bag. But there is one thing that will wrap it up and it's 
brand. Because Hermes has managed over in a long time to build equity in their brand to make it so powerful that the status this conveys is actually enough to tell people that this is very inex and very expensive pack. So it's a very different topic, status and how that links to branding, but you can see that brand helps to differentiate and also create value for a functionally similar product. You can apply this to Harley Davidson, you can apply this to many, many companies and many products. It's a bit harder on service, but it's possible too. So brand creates value. Bra brand actually creates tremendous value. Look at the most uh, powerful and the most valuable brands in the world. I've taken here, this is probably a little bit old, outdated, but still it holds. I would say if you look at the most valuable brands, this Spider brand, then what you can see here is the brand value in billions. So for instance, we'll take the example here with Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is a very valuable brand, as we can see here, 80 billions. And then you've got, of course, all the other brands that are also hugely valuable. What do you recognize? Uh, what do you recognize looking at these very valuable brands? Well, firstly, they're all American. They're really great at building brands. Secondly, I would say they're all tech, except the one in the middle. They're all tech brands. Then uh, they're all relatively young brands because they are tech brands, except for the one in the middle. So let's look at the one in the middle. These have been guys uh, that have been around for a very long time. How do they manage? Really interestingly, um, the valuation of this brand, if we compare the valuation of this brand, then 80 billion, then if we contrast this to market capitalization, right? So enterprise value or market cap, then we can go to, if we buy all the stocks of this company, uh, you know, we have to fork out 180 billion, Coca-Cola is then mine. Uh, let's assume I can buy Coca-Cola or I can, um, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, essentially, if I am able to buy all the stock of Coca-Cola, then they're mine for 180 billion. Now, let's just assume I do this. OK, I buy 480 billion Coca-Cola, go to the stock market, I buy Coca-Cola and I don't like Coca-Cola, so I'm not going to uh, give it to anyone. I'm going to take it away from everybody. I will shut all the factories. I will no longer have distribution of Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola will disappear from planet Earth because now I've bought it, right, for 180 billion. No longer Coca-Cola anywhere. Yet, what this says here is that Coca-Cola is still worth, even though I have taken this, it's still worth 80 billion. Or in other words, half of its market cap is actually in the brand, right? Because this is brand valuation. Now, where is brand valuation on a balance sheet? It's in the intangible assets. So it actually is real value, but you can't touch it. You can't touch it. So how is this? This company is worth half of what is listed on the stock exchange in terms of um, market cap is worth half in the brand, yet it's intangible, can't touch it. Remember, I've just taken every factory away from planet Earth. Coca-Cola is no longer exist. How do you explain this? It's the brand, the value of the brand. Because in a year's time, if all of a sudden I like Coca-Cola again, or two years time, or 10 years time, I can come back, I can bring this brand back, and it will have huge awareness, huge recognition, immediate traction, and people will buy Coca-Cola again. So what this company has done over time is anchor in our minds and our hearts a positioning and a concept with a product, generally, not only, that is so strong, that is hugely valuable. So the function of brand, um, ladies and gentlemen, it really is important to understand before we move into positioning and digital. So what does it do? Well, if you can, let me just make this a bit smaller. Just hold this thought here. Brand is about branding. So that's what we've seen at the beginning. It's about identification. It's, of course, about differentiation so that I can set myself apart from competition. If I do this very well, then I can simplify choice for my customers. And of course, that in turn builds trust. And the Hermes, whilst an extreme example, is to illustrate that if you do this really well over a long period of time, then you can create value. You can create tremendous tremendous value and you can monetize this value generally through your margin and hopefully your EBIT. All right, branding. We have 45 minutes only, so we've got to crack on branding. And from here we go into positioning and how positioning works and why positioning matters. So we take brand and the concepts of brand and we link this to positioning. Okay, so positioning. 
Here I will start with a question for you, ladies and gentlemen, and this is a picture of it. What is the highest mountain on planet Earth, ladies and gentlemen? The highest mountain on planet Earth. All right. It's um, uh, uh, some people will say Kilimanjaro. We don't have the zoom link here to do the polls, but some people might say it's, uh, I don't know, Mount Everest. Um, okay. You will have probably guessed it. The highest mountain on Earth is Mount Everest, 8,848 meters above sea level. And the second question I have for you, ladies and gentlemen, is what is the second highest mountain on Earth? Don't Google it. Don't Wikipedia it. What is the second highest mountain on Earth? Just in your mind, the second highest mountain on Earth is K2. K2, it's not Kilimanjaro, that's the highest mountain in Africa, but it's by far not the highest mountain on Earth. So second is K2, and ladies and gentlemen, you guessed my third question. What is the third highest mountain on planet Earth? It's not Mount Everest, and it's not K2. All right, that one, you probably uh, need to Google it, uh, because it's such a long name, it's such a complicated name, it's also in northern Pakistan, I can't even pronounce the name, but the point is, no one knows it. Unless you googled it, generally people don't know what the third highest mountain on planet Earth is. Second, this is the first man that put his feet on the moon in 1969. Gentlemen, what was his name? Ladies, what's his name? All right, many of you will have guessed it. It's Neil Armstrong that put this, uh, the first man to put a foot on the moon. And uh, you guess my second question. Second question is, uh, who's the second man to put a foot on the moon only minutes after Neil Armstrong put his foot, first foot of a human being onto the moon? Maybe one of you will know it. It's Buzz Aldrin. Buzz Aldrin was with Neil Armstrong on that mission to put his foot on the moon. And of course, there's a third one. And you guessed my third question. Who is that third one? The third one is, you won't remember it unless you've Googled it, very unlikely. The third man I'm looking for is called Michael Collins. And Michael Collins is really critical in this because Michael Collins steered the capsule, the Apollo capsule that circulated the moon whilst the guys were on the moon and he was critical because without him they would have never made it back. I mean, you know, if you don't have anywhere to go back to dock on, how are you going to get to back to planet Earth? So very critical. Yeah, correct. He didn't put the foot on the moon, but he was critical in the mission um, because without him, these guys would not have gone on the moon nor come back. Yet no one remembers him. It's like no one knows, you know, the name of the mountain I can't even pro pronounce. What am I telling you with this? What am I telling you with this? They're in positioning. However way you turn it, you've got to be first. You have to position and focus to be first in whatever product, whatever service, whatever campaign, whatever creative, whatever tagline, whatever you create. Think with this mindset of how can I be first? Because if you're first, you can really you can really build something powerful. Let's link positioning with let's link positioning with brand. What is this? This is a tissue and a tissue, of course, today in most parts of the Western world is a Kleenex. So a Kleenex is synonymous with a product. So the Kleenex brand has claimed the position of Kleenex. Super powerful. You can charge a lot more money than if you just sell a white box with Kleenex in it. So this one here is what? This one is a post-it. And if you thought that the post-it is a post-it because it looks like a post-it, it is a post-it. It's, of course, also a brand and post-it is a brand. You see underneath the identification, the mark of the logo through the application of identity, branding. They even put it, hey, it's a brand. Post-it belongs to 3M. Huge money machine. And yes, you can buy it cheaper, but if you want a genuine post-it or a genuine Kleenex, then you've got to buy the brand. And so it goes. Okay, they are first in a category with a specific product. Digital, of course, too. I mean, my generation will still remember uh, Internet Explorer still exists, but Safari, of course, as well. But there were tons of others, including Netscape and so forth that were actually around to help you browse early days, but they've solidified their position. Google clearly, uh, not so much in China, but the rest of the world pretty much 
incredibly powerful. So Google becomes a word of the dictionary. I Google it. It's a product, it's a service, and of course it's linked to a brand. Very, very powerful. And uh, in, uh, you know, positioning, we also, one thing I want to put forward is that the talk about differentiation or, or die is that you have to be extreme. So you, positioning is very much about exclusion in many ways as well, depending on where you are. This one is a Hublot 5 million. Okay, and the Hublot 5 million a beautiful watch is, it has 1200 diamonds on it. But it's called an Hublot 5 million because it costs 5 million. And look at this, right? I mean, this is clearly not for everybody, not just because it's, you know, a price ticket most people will never afford, but because many people just won't like it. It's just too bling, it's just too bold. So it's clear, it's very clear in what it does and what it says. It's a brand that's very bold. And the point here is that for some people, this is just right. They love it. And for them, it really works. And they genuinely bond, they're genuinely loyal, they, they're willing to pay 5 million for this watch if they have it. But for the majority of people, it doesn't work. They couldn't care less, right? So it's about separating these audiences very clearly by a value proposition that is extremely polarizing. Why is that so strong? Because it builds, of course, a very strong position. So brand and positioning really go together. And the key here is for you to find a territory of differentiation. If you can be that golden egg in your niche, in your segment, then that's a fantastic place to be. Short story here. Um, I told you briefly, I worked four years for Aston Martin, heading up their global marketing out of the UK. And how do you position an Aston Martin? Right? How do you do that? And it's not that obvious. It's a brand that's been around for 100 years or a little bit more. And so if you position Aston Martin, then, you know, you could think, well, why should I position it? It's in people's heads and minds anyway. But when you go to China and when we did take the, the brand to China, it became very apparent that it's not that obvious because people don't know what an Aston Martin is. They do know what a Ferrari is. It's red. It goes fast. It's Formula One, perhaps um, a Porsche. Of course, it's German technology. It's very reliable it's a sports car. It's super fast. A Lamborghini, perhaps. Uh, it's Italian lifestyle, but what's an Aston Martin? British what? So we gave this a lot of thought and uh, um, we had in the, in the Western world a positioning statement around the power and the beauty of the soul of a car like this. And it resonated with Western audiences really easily. But it didn't in China because there are five words to express soul and they all mean something different than it does in the Western world. So on the eve of a dealer training in Shanghai that we had, I spoke to the trainer, um, uh, the, train the dealers on the brand and the trainer said, I just don't know how to, how do we position this car? How do we position this brand against this fast, super red sports car from Italy, the super, you know, technology advanced um, uh, performance cars from Germany? Where, where do we fit? And so we just went through a very simple list. Ferrari is Formula One. Maserati is lifestyle and beauty. Rolls-Royce is a quintessential and Englishness. Uh, and where do we fit with Aston? And he said, well, you know, I mean, where you differentiate, and it's true from customer insights, we knew it, is the beauty of the car. And it's true when you unpick that, um, it really is the car that takes the longest to paint, 50 hours, the shot line on a uh, front, for instance, a uh, front headlamp right here, right there, no shot lines. If you go closely on a Porsche, there are shot lines. And that all in aggregate unconsciously um, makes generally, and that's subjective, uh, a impression of it's just a beautiful car. And so we, we had not much time, I'll come to that in just a second again, to really change this and we said, well, you know what? We just position it as the most beautiful car in the world. It's a territory no one has occupied. They're all about fast and performance. We're just going for design and beauty. And it worked brilliantly because it's easy for people to understand. It's really relevant and it connects and it differentiates. It's not about performance that comes afterwards. So we don't have to compete on that. We just have to be good enough or similar to that category, but we differentiate in beauty. So if anyone asks, so, you know, how does that differentiate? It's the most beautiful car in the world. So positioning, positioning and thinking about how you differentiate is super key and how that links to branding, of course, is super key as well. If you look at tech, then of course, you know, 
uh, if you look at the tagline, for instance, uh, this is a very old iPod when Apple K came and said, how do we differentiate? You can Google this. It's a fantastic story on Think Different and um, uh, how Steve Jobs managed to differentiate from the PCs and the Microsofts of the world. A thousand songs in your pocket. It really says exactly what it does. No one knew what an iPod was, but a thousand songs in your pocket, it's pretty clear. Okay, so positioning is an act of designing and offering a really uh, distinctive space uh, within the minds and hearts of your target audience, so your audience, to create relevancy so that we can find a way into the mind. And it's a super powerful concept because it doesn't just work for brands or products. It also works for people, for digital, of course. I'll have an example in just a minute to wrap up. I've got about 10 minutes left. It, of course, works on headlines, it works on content, it works on campaigns and much more. We just have to really drill ourselves and really be diligent um, uh, to use positioning and the rationale of positioning to apply it to everything we do. So how to crack it? Here in the last 10 minutes, uh, let me give you uh, my view and a few, you know, not, not in stone, but a few views on how we take attention, relevancy and speed branding and positioning and how we kind of probably can create a very simple framework that helps us to think through whether we're doing the right thing or not. So AIDA, attention, interest, desire and action, a very, very old established framework. It's a very good framework still that really looks at, well, you know, how do I create, uh, how do I grab this attention if people don't have it, want to have your attention, how can I get you interested? Uh, once I have you interested, how can I not chop desirability so you say, I must have it. I should click, for instance, in the world of digital. And how do we link that with the marketing uh, funnel? So these funnels have, of course, uh, substantially changed in the world of digital. They're no longer just linear. We won't have the time to go into it. But of course, funnels help us measure. And if we don't measure, then even AIDA is not good. It comes from the times of advertisement and billboards and TV ads. And it moved into digital with more structured approaches to use digital and CRM to be much more clever about what we do with click rates, for example, and how we optimize. optimize. Okay, so we can link this very simple framework with a purchasing funnel. And if we feel, if we think about the purchasing funnel, then it's the question goes back to positioning. How do we fill the funnel through positioning, through creating relevancy, so that we already start at the top with people who are hopefully problem aware and not just uh, never heard of them, but problem aware because it will be easier to show them the solution we have for them to navigate through that funnel. And so it's all about doing that without wasting our time and money. This is about efficiency. And here we really start to bridge digital because it can really help us do super effectively. And the framework I use for this is relatively simple. And of course, you know, all the tools you have to optimize, that's incredibly technical, it's super exciting, but it's not the topic of this session here. We use the concepts of brand and positioning to create relevancy within a structured environment in the world of digital. And our, our ambition is to say, how do we do this in the most relevant way and in the most efficient way from a point of creating relevancy? so we can increase conversion. All right, audience on the left-hand side, I have a target audience. I need to understand them infinitely well. And on the right-hand side, I have an offer. I have a product. I have a service. I have a value proposition. In the middle, what I need to really think about is attention. How do I grab their attention and where does that happen? How can I be relevant? How can I be quick? Remember speed. What brand do I have? How can I position my value proposition? And of course, how does digital enable this to come together? Let's have a look on how this works. I've picked a uh, hypothetical. It's actually not a hypothetical and you're more than welcome and in, invite you to try it after our session here. Firstly, attention. I know I've got eight seconds. Remember the goldfish has nine seconds. I have eight seconds. Relevancy. Where can I create something um, relevant? Well, let's say I'm going to create relevancy around a meme. Okay. Um, a meme out there. Um, speed. Of course, I have to have light speed. I have to be very fast. Brand. Let's say I use my personal brand, for instance. Uh, okay, so if I have something really short, really snappy, based around a meme, uh, then uh, yeah, where can I be first with that? And then how can I use digital to activate? Let's have a look. 
My audience for this short exercise is teenagers. I want to create something that's really cool, that grabs their attention, that's relevant, that works around my brand, and that is positioned super quickly, it's super clear, and where I can use digital to create that. So what could that be? I create the game, for instance, okay? But it won't be Fortnite, right? They don't have the resources. My personal brand is not geared to that. And it probably isn't around eight seconds and memes and speed that I've defined here as my framework. So I'll create a super easy, super simple game. And if I look at this, okay, a game probably would tick the box of eight seconds. If it's memed, if it's light, if it's personal, if it's super quick, and can I be first? Where, where, what sweet spot would I have to pick in the world of digital? Let's take a US rapper around which there is a huge meme going on called Da Baby. You can Google him, you can Wikipedia it, but there's a big meme around him. There's a big theme around him going on. So I'm talking about teenagers. I'm talking about something relevant to them. I'm talking about a theme and a meme. And if you look at the meme that's going on, then the meme that went viral recently is, uh, is, uh, is, is, the, is, is this guy turning into a convertible car. Uh, dub baby convertible you can see this is relatively recent i think this is from march not long ago a couple of weeks ago and so the meme goes around this guy turning into a pt cruiser you can check this out so huge meme going on very fast uh, very relevant to probably a teenage population on TikTok, let's say, and what I can do by reading really fast and using this idea of brand positioning specifically to combine it is create the game. So you create the game and you create the game around the meme, around the theme that doesn't take long to create. You upload it on the app store and you have something that is positioned for that audience in a relevant way that's you know, been done at the speed of light. And that's actually going to be uh, fun to play, to entertain, to grab a little bit of your attention. So by doing this, you use, of course, uh, channels and not is send well, Facebook's definitely not the channel to use it. Think about channel and allocation that is going to be on TikTok. So you create videos on TikTok and how you do this, how you put the game together, how you put it up there. You can check it out. It's actually fun to play. And then within no time, you've created something really interesting for an audience that probably sees this as relevant with the speed of light through using a very sharp, very polarized, but very clear positioning around that meme and you create a value proposition that becomes relevant. And you use, of course, digital, in this instance, TikTok, to activate. All right, so eight seconds, super light, super quick, be first and be digital. And here's a, a, a it's a bit of a stretch, but I still think it's quite a nice way to show how this traditional way of thinking in branding bridges to the discipline on how we crack stuff in the world of digital. So please go for it, check it out, download it. It's good fun. So wrapping it up, I appreciate we have only three minutes left, but brand strategy meets digital. It's of course, brand almost always is um, talking to the rational and the irrational mind. So it's emotional. First, we, we function and we react with our instincts first. So you have to build emotional triggers in, but we justify with rationality. So you've seen this with Hermes back, extreme example of how value creation works and brands do create value. Positioning is about exclusion. So you have to differentiate, you have to be bold. You also have to take some bold bets. Attention with diminishing returns. This is about cut through fast, whatever you do. Think it through very, I mean, positioning is long term, we say, but in campaigns or in tagline development, in SEO and so forth is where the thinking happens, where you really use positioning to then define your keywords, for instance. Okay, if you do this well, then you create relevancy. You have to be super clear on your audience and on your value and your proposition. And that in turn means you have to be first. So be first, be Mount Everest, be Neil Armstrong. And I would also say, you know, in the world of digital, whereas Peter Drucker and all the management gurus probably had months and years to think strategically, today uh, have a strategy, take the time, but don't sweat it. Be fast, activate, be agile, learn and adjust, keep optimizing, and of course, scale, scale as quickly as you can.
All right, guys, it's um, a pleasure to be with you. I know my 45 minutes are up. Please follow me. Please connect on LinkedIn. Uh, please check out my websites, of course. Please drop me a note if you have questions and if you want the right answer to the number of babies and the smartphones and how many smartphones went on the grid in two minutes, then please drop me a note and it'd be a pleasure to stay in touch. I hope you guys have a fantastic rest of the conference. If we had the time now for a fireside chat, then of course we would have a fireside chat to discuss together. Unfortunately, in the format here, this is not quite possible, but you guys have a fantastic day and a fantastic day and a fantastic rest of your conference. All right. It's been a pleasure to be with you. I wish you all the very best and a good continued conference. Take care, everyone.